Um, how many guys are you expecting out of interest? What is the... Um, the We're already broadcasting, but we have, um, it should be around 100 people. 100 people. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to begin. So, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this fourth session. Uh, so this is the fourth time here at Climate Chance we've been organizing the virtual workshops. Uh, this session will be, will be on agriculture, food and reforestation. So um, welcome everybody. I can see you're all arriving right now. First thing to mention is that we have live translation available. Um, most of us today will be speaking in English, but if you need to follow in French, all you have to do is click on the interpretation button that's at the bottom of your screen and click on the language that you need to, to follow in. Um, the session today will also be recorded. So if you um, need to follow or need to watch the, the session once again, you can find it on our website, which we'll be sending to you very soon. Um, also, I need to mention that uh, if you have any questions or comments throughout the this session, please feel free to send them in the in the live chat and we'll have some time at the end to answer any of your questions or comments. So my name is Eva Radek and I'm Events and Co Coalitions Officer here at Climate Chance. Um, just to give you a brief introduction to Climate Chance, um, it's an international organisation that was formed in 2015 in the leading up to COP21 in Paris. So Climate Chance gathers all non-state actors and aims to create synergies between the nine major groups recognized by the UNFCCC, which I'm sure you already know is uh, local governments, organizations, NGOs, uh, researchers, but also women's groups, indigenous groups, uh, etc. So we have a, uh, a website, which will be shared in the chat box right now by my colleague, um, where we publish all information on local climate action in both English and French. We also have a portal of action where we gather best practices, and particularly uh, best practices uh, from the African continent. Um, so the portal is a way of giving access to information and data on climate change, but also local and regional issues as well. So we also have um, a Climate Chance Observatory, uh, which analyzes implemented climate action worldwide, um, puts together yearly publications that are also available on our website. Um, the objective of, this, uh, of our Climate Chance Observatory is mainly to explain concrete uh, implemented action worldwide in a variety of sectors and as I said you can find uh, all of the observatories work on our website we have uh, case studies but also sectoral books and the, well, the yearly synthesis report is all available online um, so climate chance also of course organizes yearly summits uh, gathering our various uh, African coalitions each with their own roadmaps so uh, during the summit, we organize workshops for each of our coalitions and members have the opportunity to take, to take stock of uh, what's going on basically in, in each of their sectors. So unfortunately, due to the whole pandemic situation at the moment, this year's summit that was due to take place in Kigali in Rwanda was postponed and um, this didn't stop us from wanting to take some action still. We actually decided to transform our usual uh, workshops into virtual workshops. And uh, so we've created this whole series of virtual workshops that was launched in July. So through these work virtual workshops, we continue to mobilize our, our coalitions and we follow up on the work of each one of our, which, each one of our roadmaps. So the first um, round of virtual workshops aims to regain contact with members and, on, and the co-pilots of each of the coalitions and to present how the situation has changed due to the, due to the pandemic. So the second round um, will take place from January and the second round will be more uh, to move forward with the roadmaps of each of the coalitions. So today's session will be dedicated to the agriculture and food sector 
We really would like to thank all of our panelists for agreeing to share some of their experience and, and for sharing their expertise in the domain. Um, the discussion will be around the following question. How does a pandemic such as COVID-19 lead to a drastic reorganization of the food system and distribution chains? So I'd therefore like to welcome Louise Lanson, who is co-founder of Let's Food, Let's Food Cities and is also one of the co-pilots of the coalition. We also normally have with us today Matsilane Fala, I think she'll be joining in a few minutes, uh, who is aquaculture specialist to working at the municipi municipality of Irpiquini in uh, South Africa. We also have, us with us, have with us today Suleiman Gay, who is also part of the coalition since very recently and is working as country representative of Burkina Faso uh, for the NGO called Niti Day. And then finally, we also have with us Walter Coughlin, who's the uh, co-founder as well of um, the food, Fair Food Company. So without further ado, I'd like to give uh, the floor to Anna Fouché from Let's Food Cities, who will be moderating this session for us. And uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Eva, for the presentation. So uh, we're going to hear four speakers today, you just presented them, uh, and different initiatives coming from South Africa, Burkina Faso, and we will talk about different cities also around the world. Uh, so let's begin <laughs> with uh, Louison, who's going to talk about the, the study we've done during the, the lockdown <laughs> and uh, show us uh, some results uh, now. So the floor is yours, Louison. Thank you. Um, thank you. Maybe to present briefly our, our NGO, uh, very briefly, Let's Food is a French-based NGO aiming at fostering city-to-city -city cooperation for more sustainable food systems. So in the past three years, we've been working with 14 cities around the world within the Let's Food Cities project, uh, including uh, Durban, uh, but also cities in Morocco and Tunisia. And uh, recently, in April, May, we, we conducted a survey to understand the impact of COVID-19 on, on food system sustainability and collect adaptation and mitigation measures uh, taken by local authorities and civil society organizations. And we got around 100 respondents. Uh, so today I'm going to talk, I'm going to give some, some results of this, this analysis and maybe showcase a few of the examples. Um, so one of the, the, the first kind of results that we got is how COVID-19 actually showed the vulnerability of our food system and speci specifically of our food supply and distribution systems. So uh, as we, we all know, I guess, in response to COVID-19, a lot of borders have been closed and the food flows were thus uh, interrupted. Uh, this fully revealed the, an extreme interdependence between countries when it comes to food supply and distribution. Uh, and so we identified, we identified uh, four main uh, issues that were actually, uh, uh, that actually came out of the survey uh, when it comes to the impact of the COVID-19 on the food distribution channels. Sorry, uh, Louison. Yeah. Just to make sure that the sound is all right because I can read the, the comments. Eva, I don't know, shall we continue or shall we start a bit just? Uh, I think you maybe need to speak closer to the microphone if possible, because yeah. I can hear you. I think you I just think need to speak a bit louder. Oh, can I, can I remove maybe the... Um, Your microphone on the, yeah, on the yeah, earphones. Try to, okay. Better now? Yes, much better. <laughs> that we are the two in the same room so i was i had the microphone but maybe what well, okay uh do i need to start over or i can i can summarize in maybe okay uh so we conducted within let's food um in the past few months we conducted a survey to actually uh, identify the the impact understand the impact of covid19 on uh, food system sustainability and collect adaptation and mitigation measures taken by local authorities, civil society organizations, 
So we got around 100 uh, answers. And so it gave us uh, a good idea of how the, the food system was impacted. And also I'm going to talk about uh, a few examples that actually came out of this survey. So first of all, we, we saw that COVID-19 has the, the biggest impact of, on the food supply and distribution channels is that COVID-19 has um, been has closed and the, the borders and the food flows were kind of interrupted. So this really revealed uh, an extreme dependence uh, between countries when it comes to the food supply and distribution. So basically, uh, this survey showed us that there were four main kind of impacts that we could identify. First of all, was because of the, 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 the borders closing, the lack of foreign labor force, uh, mostly in Europe. So this was one of the main problems that farmers could not find enough, la enough labor force to actually harvest and conduct the, the field activities. Then we, the second one was the, the food shortage in case of countries that highly depend on imports to actually supply their population. The third uh, main issue was uh, the, the, the opposite, actually countries like, for example, Vietnam with a positive commercial balance that were finding themselves with a major food surplus, impossible to export and therefore wasted. And the, the fourth problem identified was also the, um, the food prices that were rising up because of food scarcity in some countries, uh, really limiting access to food for uh, a big part of the population that is already vulnerable. So these are the four main uh, issues that came out of this survey. But then we, we also identified and, and, and witnessed many, many initiatives coming from civil society and local authorities to actually answer in the short term to those, those issues and make sure that food security and nutrition is ensured. Um, so here again, we identified different kinds of initiatives that, that were taken. First of all, we, we, we saw that many municipalities got involved directly in making the link between producers and, and consumers. So the municipalities were in most cases, buying directly products from local producers and, re and distribute uh, the products through food baskets to the most vulnerable. So for example, we, we identify this kind of uh, process in Marseille in France, but also in Ecuador, in Asuay, in Leco in Italy, uh, where they actually put in place a food card uh, program that was distributed to the most vulnerable uh, part of the population and that gave us access to, to local food and fresh food. Uh, then the second kind of initiative that actually multiplied in, in the past months were the creation of online platforms. This, ha this is like a major, major um, uh, observation that many online platforms were set up by municipalities or by CSOs to directly connect uh, farmers and consumers. This is also something, something interesting because we can also question uh, the relevance of this kind of platform, maybe in some countries where not everyone has access to this kind of platform or just to uh, a stable internet connection. So this also uh, question other, other issues. Um, the third kind of initiative was uh, also online platforms, but this time to actually connect producers in need of labor force with job seekers uh, that were in their own country, actually. So this, I think, was most, mostly flourishing in, in Europe. Uh, from our experience in France, this was a big thing. And uh, the fourth uh, short-term initiative that we identified was also new kind of relations between actors to actually to actually try to to connect uh, local farmers that could not find uh, markets because their export exportation market were actually closed and and local supermarkets or markets that could not find uh, supply so municipalities for example in lyon in france they actually uh, work with the chamber of agriculture and they identified the, the, those actors from the production side and the consumer side and actually put them in touch. And they were able to actually supply supermarkets with local products 
And until now, this was not something that was done. The supermarkets had very, very closed and, and different um, uh, food supply chains. Um, and then uh, the third main result of uh, this survey and last result of this survey is also this uh, showed us that some countries were already much better prepared for this kind of crisis than, than others uh, based on their experience, based on what they, they tried, they, they've been trying to build uh, for, for years. And so this gave us a good idea of maybe the initiatives that need to be, to be structurally integrated into the agricultural policies, food policies in, in the long term to actually anticipate this kind of crisis. Uh, apparently the sound is not really working. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what to do, but I, I keep going. I just have a few minutes left. Um, so we identified four main uh, policies or actions that actually can, can help in, in anticipating this kind of crisis. We, we saw, for example, some countries that put in place very, uh, very ambitious policies, for example, the school canteen programs that actually exist in many countries um, and that is developing was a strong tool to make food access, uh, accessible for everyone, even in, in, in a case of crisis where schools were actually closed. Uh, countries find a way to actually replace the, 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 the school canteen system with maybe the distribution of food baskets uh, to those families. And so they already had all the logistic to prepare the meals, to distribute the meals. So they already had this kind of, of, uh, of logistics. Uh, but also this make us think about other policies that need to go even beyond that. Uh, policies about giving the, the, the access to food and making access to food as a, a human right. Uh, maybe actually uh, we, we might talk about it later with, with Durban because they've put in place a, a very interesting system for the, the school canteen program. Um, second of all, we also identified some countries like Vietnam, for example, with whom we've been also working for the past years, uh, that actually kept um, a very good agricultural production diversity and who do not depend so much on imports to, to, to feed their, their population. So they didn't really have big issues in terms of food shortage uh, that they, they managed to, to keep a diversity. Then uh, other countries or cities like Birmingham, for example, uh, they, they shared with us their, their initiative of uh, their food policy council. So building strong, new, strong governance uh, instances were actually helping to, to then cope with uh, future crises uh, in terms of food supply and distribution because the links through this governance system, the links between the different stakeholders are already made. And so it made it really easy to, to, to make connections between those actors and, and ensure food supply, even if there is a shortage for some uh, food chains. And, and thirdly, um, and lastly, sorry, uh, we also uh, identified uh, inter-regional uh, cooperation as a, as a tool to, to anticipate this kind of crisis. We saw that in some countries, the region have been working together for, for many years already, uh, making it possible to have uh, easy and, and good uh, connections in terms of uh, food distribution. Um, this seems obvious, but sometimes uh, different instances, administration, they don't even talk to each other and they don't know each other. And so instead of, um, of importing food, they, they, they already try to import food, but from other regions of the country. So in some countries, they already have these kind of links and this really helped in a case, uh, in this case of, of uh, uh, a crisis like we, we've been through. So it was really brief. So we, we published um, a paper that gives more details and get that gives more examples. So I invite you to to consult it, and and thank you very much. 
Thank you, Louison, for all these initiatives and results. Uh, maybe just uh, uh, information, if you have any questions, please write them down in the Q&R section. Oh. And uh, yeah, we have time um, maybe at the end of the conversation, uh, or maybe not, maybe we'll try to answer directly. Uh, Romain, what were, you, what were your answer? concerning the subjects are we gonna have we're gonna have time at the end to talk a bit okay uh, so I will now pass on to Mathilde Anfala who just arrived uh, she works uh, at the agroecology unit of the Etequini municipality uh, and uh, she's going to talk about how the municipality supported the local farmers uh, facing the COVID-19 crisis. I think she's just had a problem uh, with her internet okay. once again. She so, seems like she's just uh, lost connection. Okay, so maybe we can stay on Durban and give the floor to Walter. So who's the, the founder of the Fair Food Company. And uh, so you're going to explain uh, different adaptation measures that you took during the facing the crisis. So the um, and present. Thank you, Anna. Um, I just put a small presentation together that might assist with the background where we come from, and then um, reach some of the outputs that were suggested from the um, the requirements or the, the, the topic that we're trying to address. I just have the host disabled attendee screen. Um, Eva, if you could just uh, allow me to share. If not, I can talk through it. Okay, thank you. I'll try again. Okay, let's try here quickly. Um, uh, sorry about this. Um, okay, so I'm going to go fairly fast through it because um, it's important to realize where we come from and to contextualize where we are so that um, our response is, um, makes more sense to those that are, um, are participating. Um, we're the Fair Food Company, I'm the, one of the program directors and the founder of the Fair Food Company. We set up um, as a non-profit company in 1995 and we've merged into a social enterprise um, which we are today. The purpose of the presentation is just to give you the background. Um, these typically are our farmers and our growers that are working on our fields together with us in partnership, um, either as suppliers to us or as, um, or as uh, 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 contract growers uh, to the program. Um, just briefly, I'll skip through this, so please ex uh, excuse, uh, excuse my rush. Uh, I, I, I am available to share later in more detail about our organization. We are a, a, an organization that was established out of the an NGO space. We've worked in the NGO space, working particularly with small scale growers. We have an inclusive and shared value ethos that defines really our DNA. 51% of farmers um, currently are part of our membership base in our shareholding in the Fair Food Company. And we really established ourselves to address the small scale growers value in the um, in the food chain. Uh, small scale farmers generally are excluded after the farm gate um, point. They supply product to the middlemen. The middlemen then take that product, they add value to it, or they have relationships with the market and they move that product to the market. So a large part of our business is structured around working with employees, sorry, working with our partner farmers um, and through our business, offering them more than just the farm gate price for their product, but allowing them to access the, um, the benefits of the, the, of the growth that the company um, is accessing in these particular value add markets. Um, that just gives you a quick um, idea of the provenance where we started out in 1995. Most of this um, up until 2017 was our social, uh, was our NGO work. We were funded to develop edamame in South Africa, which is the bright green soybean that we moved success, successfully into a higher retail market. That got us thinking, how do we move an NGO into a commercial space? Now, moving into commercial space didn't mean that we neglected our emerging growers and our small scale growers. We wanted to bring them in. So the mechanism we found is to build a social enterprise. We established the Fair Food Farmers Trust, which is where our, our farmers are accessing our business as a shareholder. And we moved into the Fair Food Company. We've just recently secured an equity partnership grouping. This is a quick indication of 
where we come as an agro, how we set up as an agro processing facility, we have has a facility, I think we're just doing FSSC 22,000 to ensure that the food that we produce for our customers this is the food service sector, which is um, 20, uh, 10, between 10 and 10, 20% currently coming from our emerging farmers. The balance comes from the market, um, goes through a, a, a food grade processing facility that allows us to satisfy and compete in the market of food service sector. Um, edamame was our, um, our key product that we launched into the market with. Um, very highly successful, or it's not highly successful, highly valuable and important protein uh, source, both for our farmers who consume it themselves and for the market. It's a niche crop in South Africa. It's growing. It's following Europe and American trends. These are some of our growing programs over the years with our farmers. Uh, some of it's mechanical. This is a little bit more commercial of our commercial growers. The rest of it is our small scale growers, which you largely work with. Um, small scale growers, meaning about a hectare to a hectare and a half. Um, people either farming it collectively or in partnership together. These are some of our edamame range product that you will find in the market or about to go into the market. We also utilize our product. Um, uh, we also allow the retailers to pack in their own version. Uh, edamame um, is, um, uh, it's, it's quite nice to know that 90% of the edamame you find in the top end retailer in South Africa is grown by emerging farmers. Um, and 90% of those emerging farmers or operate, no, uh, no sorry, seven, around between 70 and 80% of those emerging farms are smaller one hectare size farms. Um, these are some of our customers that we supply, a value proposition. Um, uh, we work through taking our farmers through a uh, cadet skills uh, phase into becoming a shareholder. Um, I was mindful of the time. Um, our operational capabilities are really there. We are slightly, we, we're growing in terms of a group. We're looking at, um, a, a national market playing space, but underpinning it is the small scale growers and our, um, our, uh, our um, who are our shareholders at the end of the day. I'll move quite quickly through this to get to the key points for today. Um, our shareholding, you'll see there is a previous shareholding that is currently moving to a current shareholding stage. You'll see our farms are represented in the trust over here. So it's a true social enterprise. Uh, we've been moving into that some of our core team and members that are involved with us, all passionate about ensuring that farmers get to represent them are represented in the value chain of food. Um, it's, a, it's quite an innovative approach. Uh, we are upsetting the apple cart in many ways, and we're a little bit of a different business. We make less profit, um, but we, where we do make profit, the intention is to share it with our shareholders. Some of them are farmers. Um, getting down to the COVID-19 impact, um, what happened during the COVID-19 impact as far as, um, uh, uh, with respect to small growers, these are small and medium growers. Um, we lost 70% of our customers over the four months. It was a massive uh, reduction. Basically, business uh, or, 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 or more than halved. It meant that uh, um, uh, 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 basically our income from sales and revenues um, dropped, um, and we uh, we were a little bit stuck. Fortunately, because our customers are on the 60 and 90 day um, uh, um, payment program, we were able to take ourselves a little bit into the COVID challenge by living off the, um, the invoices that were submitted two months prior. So uh, the challenge really came in the last couple of months where we had now exhausted that and we had been only working at a 30% rate. Um, just remember when you talk about 70% um, reduction, it's uh, uh, just bear in mind that only uh, the 10-15% the are coming from our emerging farmers. So the basis, the balance of it comes from markets, traditional bulk food markets which we go and purchase and those are supplied by big commercial farmers and smaller com commercial farmers. How did it impact our farmers with respect to the small scale growers? Um, there was a medium disruption we found, which I thought was quite an interesting um, uh, observation. All our small growers, these are guys maybe working on um, ten, uh, five uh, to 10 hectare sites. Um, they didn't feel the impact. These are a little bit um, uh, urban, uh, between urban and rural areas. Um, they it seemed that they were operating in an island um, uh, that wasn't too affected by the commotion that was happening around the food. Um, the market challenge, um, they were, it, was, it was quite clear that there was um, uh, um, a, 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 a decrease in the available market to them. They were running on food um, supply cycles, so they weren't supplying every single day. But over the period of COVID, uh, there was still an offtake. Food was still needed by people. And um, we found that um, local communities surrounding them were able to, um, where they were able to supply greater amounts because there was a greater need. Um, a lot more people were at home. 
and they didn't necessarily have an eye with respect to our small scale growers. Not all of them have contracts with um, off takers, typical market type off takers where people are coming in and loading up um, 50 tons of butternut, for example, or potatoes. They are small, medium uh, sector growers. That large portion of their market is local markets, 40%. So they weren't that 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 intensively affected. Um, obviously, the inputs were limited. They couldn't get access to fertilizers, um, uh, seedlings, or the, a lot of the seedling nurseries closed. So there was a little bit of a challenge on that side. Um, the, um, the, 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 I think uh, I'm just trying to re recall what I, why I noted that the knee-jerk reaction um, of the supplier, uh, because the sector is an, an, an unorganized. So, we, we, we escaped in a sense from the farmers because we don't have these traditional supply chains that are running from farmers directly to markets. This is a largely informal market that is unorganized. Because it's unorganized, there wasn't this direct um, impact on the small scale growers. There obviously was definitely a direct impact on bigger growers. We saw the big traditional markets where we procure a product from being affected. It, um, staff there had to, uh, were, were affected, um, who were affected with COVID-19. Um, require resulted in some of the markets being closed down. All the market, um, the, the, the large uh, fresh produce market um, buyers, um, and many of them informal. Those are people that buy from the market and sell in the typical township um, or informal areas were affected because they were stopped from entering the market because there wasn't a protocol in place for people um, to be checked before they entered the market. So it was, in a sense, a, a potential cesspit for COVID transmission, which it took us a while to get that right. And now, currently, even still there, the market only operates from um, 6 o'clock in the morning till 9.30. So it, current, it used to always run until around about 12, 1 o'clock. So there's a knock-on effect in, in that sort of stuff. In terms of our staff and, and how the COVID-19 affected us, um, cash flow was directly impacted. Um, we also, um, we, we, we profitability uh, resulted in us having to look at the 70% currently now uh, staff reduction across the board. Everyone took the pain. We couldn't get rid of certain people because we felt like we were all in this together. We were very fortunate and that's something that our government was really fantastic about. And a lot of people complain that didn't get the support, but we have a program called TERS where government looks at supporting us for various, um, uh, offsetting some of the cost reduction to our staff. So they pay uh, up to 50% of our, 70% uh, of our staff um, um, monthly payments, which was a great support. Without that honesty, we would have a problem. Our banks came in and supported us and gave us extensions on overdraft and, decre and decreased our, uh, our time, uh, our, sorry, our, our monthly debit orders on our vehicles that was frozen for a period of three months, which we were very grateful for. Um, so I'm just trying to get to my next slide. Uh, um, uh, quickly, the gaps in the food supply chain. Previously normal is, is, inf is informal and current normal is still informal. We've got a lot of work to do, which is a part of the discussion that uh, we work with you guys overseas is to how to formalize our system better in, in order to, to represent the small scale grower in the food supply chain. It's, it's informal and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make the small scale grower representative in the supply chain. He or she who supplies isn't currently formalized and that's the work we need to do. We need to structure it and particularly post harvest where the opportunities are. A lot of effort from our government uh, local municipality, et cetera, who also support us, goes into farmer development. And the missing link is often how to get that farmer develop, uh, develop, developing and development farmers produce into the market. Um, the partnerships of uh, sector actors is also required. Um, all of us playing from our municipality into the private sector, into the NGO sector, we don't necessarily talk with each other. Um, so we realize uh, that's a, a glaring gap. And because of that, things fall through the cracks and we don't have a uh, cracks. We don't have a structured approach to, 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 to solving our problems when we get into, into these particular challenges. Um, um, the risks in the pandemic situation, of course, it was quite clear what happened to us in, our, in the context, things closed down, everybody was really scared. Food availab availability became a, a buzzword that went around. We got worried, particularly the communication processes to avoid panic. We weren't prepared for it. I think we'd be better prepared for it moving ahead. Um, the vulnerable sectors were most exposed. Um, these are people that are on a social um, system where they have a requirement to get supported by the state. Um, they were clearly um, not in, in, in panic because either there wasn't food available or limited food available. The prices went up. 
Walter, Sorry. if I can, can you maybe slow down just a little bit so we can translate at the same time in French? <laughs> Thanks, because <laughs> it's Sorry. really interesting. Uh, Sorry. Um, the, um, we, we saw um, price sparks um, happen in the informal um, and the formal areas. Um, you would probably be all aware of the craziness that everyone went mad in the beginning, things like toilet paper and that, but also food was affected. Um, it wasn't so much of the, of the crazy price in food sparks as it was the availability of the food um, around, in particular in the populations of people where food was needed. And typically one would get into a tax in an informal area, pay a fee, drive to a large retailer, purchase your goods, and then uh, drive back again. There's a great informal network of spaza shops, we call them here, which are basically type of shipping containers or small structures where people sell bread and milk and uh, airtime and vegetables. And um, because there was a knock-on effect on pricing and those people couldn't necessarily get to the market or pay the greater price to pay to the market, they still made available um, vegetables and food, but the price went up. So we, we looked at, and I think this is part of the risk and the resilience solutions, is how do we build in a model that when there is the next COVID or the next pandemic, we can ensure that we've got a link between our farmers into our um, informal suppliers, in the, in, in, particularly in the areas where it's most affected, that keeps the model and the pricing affordable. Um, we, um, Sorry. We, we, <laughs> Sorry again, yes, that's me. Uh, so can you have just one minute left to finish and then we can that's it. To, Yes, oh, oh, that's sorry. <laughs> um, we've got, um, um, we, we have a, a methodology of promoting farming and farmers engagement in the food sector. It's through, uh, it was largely pushed politically through cooperative development. It's not always the right way and we need to be able to work with our political partners in the space to, to find solutions. Um, the resilience side, we need to invest in partnerships, really key, important, Make, invest time and money. Understand the market and the food journey from farm to outlet. We need to all understand it carefully, carefully so that our policies inform uh, models of uh, reactive models when these issues happen. And even outside of the reactive models, there's a massive need for us to talk. And that's a great thing about what you guys are doing in your network is making us start to talk. Um, um, Middle range interventions. We can't wait for the next pandemic. We need to be proactive uh, 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 um, versus being simply reactive. Worldwide learnings, um, published research. We need to see where we are through these kinds of networks, understand the research and learnings coming out from groups like yours and others in our types of like South America and um, parts of Asia where we can identify with our typical types of growers and learn from each other and share. Um, um, and I think the, uh, there's been a growth in the appreciation of supply from emerging growers and NGOs. A lot of good work did happen um, around that system. People came out of the woodwork and started working towards finding solutions, both local government, ourselves, NGOs, churches, et cetera. And I think that's the end. Thank you. Sorry about the time. No, thank you very much uh, for all this information, impacts and solution for better resilience. So the, the information will be shared at the end of the session. And uh, if you have specific questions also you to, for the speakers, you can also ask them directly in the chat and speakers can answer directly. Um, so moving on to uh, local authorities and local governments, so I'm going to give the floor to Matsdelen Fala, who's working at the Tequini municipality of uh, so Durban in South Africa. And uh, so she's going to tell us a bit more about how the municipality supported the local farmers facing this crisis. So Matsdelen, if it's working, the floor is yours. Is it working? <laughs> I can't see her anymore in the console. Okay, 
so maybe we'll try something else and uh, I'll pass on to Suleiman waiting for Madeleine to come back and so we're gonna go to Burkina Faso and we'll come back to Durban afterwards and uh, so maybe uh, Suleiman, yeah, Suleiman Gay who's working in an NGO called Nitide and is uh, gonna explain to us how he's um, working on the participatory guarantee system to help local farmers. So if it's okay, the floor is yours. Ow. <laughs> Uh, bonjour, à tout bonjour. Monde. hello everyone. Thank you, Anna, for your introduction. And I say hi to all the speakers and all the panelists and the participants. My name is Suleiman Gay, and I am the representative of the Nitin Day, which is an NGO, and the headquarters of Nitin Day is in Lyon, in France. And we work in various countries in Africa, in West Africa mainly. And our main objective is to oversee a development and implement a new development for both conservation and development. And in this respect, uh, we have implemented in Burkina Faso various activities to promote uh, to promote local production and food safety. As you know, I'm sure recently, none of the West African countries could escape the pandemic of the COVID-19 and its waves of effects. And as you also know, in Burkina Faso, the COVID-19 marked an almost total halt uh, to socio-economic activity because mainly of the uh, border closures, also the restriction of the movement and the market closing down, uh, curfews and also lockdown. So all of these aspects during the COVID-19 did not facilitate uh, movements between the various localities. So it must be admitted that this forced halt caused by the mitigation measures uh, taken by the local authorities in order to slow down the, uh, the pace of the infection, uh, seriously impacted all the sectors at different, sect uh, different scales in a country like Burkina Faso, where food and nutrition security was already a source of concern. Uh, why? Because Burkina Faso is one of the countries in West Africa that is uh, going through a type of insecurity, very important insecurity, uh, added to internal conflicts, which already affected the country in the past. So the, the ability of the population to be able to, um, to procure rich, nutritious uh, food was, diffi was made difficult in order to meet their uh, nutritious ne needs. Uh, the COVID-19 has, um, has added onto the previous insecurities and concerns that we faced and also um, highlighted the uh, situation that the population found themselves into because of the reducing of the availability and accessibility of the basic food stops for the most vulnerable populations and the populations overall and the situation of blockage uh, with the uh, closing down of the borders the uh, lockdown and curfew in some cities and the locked and the closing down of some markets kind of created a fracture if you like in the food supply chain in Burkina Faso so this situation has really uh, led to a fracture therefore villages and outskirts of towns outside of the main cities like Ouagadougou or others uh, has made difficult 
uh, their supply of vegetables and fresh product because of all these difficulties of access, uh, the lockdown, the closure of borders and the quarantine of certain cities. As I said earlier, also the air borders were completely closed. So there was like an immobility and no more trade, business uh, transactions, food exchanges. This was almost at a halt. All these various movements, whether inside or outside, were all at halt. So what we felt very quickly was a fracture in the supply chain, which created a, a concern, a genuine concern with both producers and consumers. It was an unexpected situation. People were no longer able to come and go like they used to. And all of a sudden, everything was stopped. And it raised a real concern among the producers. Now, uh, regarding now the SPG or the experience that we have, uh, uh, in Burkina Faso regarding the uh, system participating participatory guarantee for the guarantee or the participatory system and the organize the activities of our organization uh, was mainly to help uh, these these producers gain regain confidence and to assert the uh, guarantee of these products. It was the issue between a producer that was delivering their production to the uh, market and the consumer going to the market to be uh, to get provided with the food. So as an NGO, we felt we had no right to give up. We needed to find new means and new ways to uh, to help producers. Uh, uh, regain the trust and the confidence and also bring the consumer the necessary trust. So we uh, we use the system called the Guarantee Participatory System, uh, but our particularity here in Burkina Faso is that the system has been really uh, deployed by the various stakeholders. It's not something that we came up with. It was an initiative from the stakeholders in the food industry or in the uh, production industry. And as an NGO, we came alongside to support something that was already existing, but that had difficulty being implemented. We were trying to simply uh, support this system here in Burkina Faso and help implement new norm standards and develop on the other side a roadmap for the certification of products and the idea is to be more democratic or to diverse uh, the various local productions as i said earlier this is a system that is a guarantee system a participatory system and the idea is to gather all the various stakeholders on the territory so that they can rely on the norm, the standard that has been developed and, and refer back to the uh, um, roadmap to be able to rely on the producers and to know for sure that uh, this or that territory is respecting the various norms. As I said, this initiative uh, aimed at uh, the promotion of local uh, production and local consumption uh, by uh, releasing all the various local products uh, with the, um, the support of this uh, GPS, Guarantee Participatory System, and with people who are members of the uh, Agricultural Council or other members who are um, uh, some advocates of local agriculture it's a system that really helped us promote uh, the short uh, supply chain and the distribution of baskets to promote the local production for each territory to be able to produce what they consume. Since we, since the COVID-19, we uh, accelerated accelerated the. Uh, implementation of this system and 
try to see how to support the local consumers and the local producers, producers and to put them in connection. So what did we do? We imagined and developed in that sense uh, some systems, resilient systems, by relying on the GPS uh, system and highlighting the various uh, competences and expertise of private sectors uh, with the certified producers, uh, organic, uh, certified organic producers. And the idea was to, to implement a system that would be more adequate, that would be more um, rely, reliable and mm, reduce the negative impact with the producers, certified producers, so that they could more easily sell their production directly directly to their uh, customers. And this is how we developed, or rather we reinforced this uh, distribution or supply chain system with a bioprotect system to reinforce the technology and the capacities, uh, technical capacities. Uh, and we set up a WhatsApp group, which we had already uh, done in the past, but with the COVID-19, we have uh, uh, even developed it further and uh, improved this WhatsApp group to adapt it to the new uh, context to put in touch uh, con local producers and local consumers and cons producers who were already in par part of the system, and but also retailers and to make the connection between them and facilitate the market. We do have this WhatsApp group, which helped all the consumers in a locality to actually order from uh, this WhatsApp group, from their phone to order food. They could actually place some orders through text messages and directly text uh, this uh, private operator which served as a support or as a connection between producers and consumers and have it delivered directly at their home uh, through some local agents recruited by this platform, by this uh, private operator. On the other hand, the producers could directly call uh, the operator. Uh, all they had to do was to place the order and the number, the amount of products, etc. Now for payments, uh, we had made, uh, made it easier with a payment system for the consumer to be able to pay exactly and directly through the operator system, the kind of operator system that is already used. You only have one minute if you can come to your conclusion. Thank you, yes. The last point is to say that the uh, was advising the producers in order to fulfill our mission as an NGO, we reinforced a system, our support system. We have a, a platform which we started to help all the producers to access all the best practices, the information, the technology. We had uh, recorded micro program, local micro programs for these producers to have access and find all the information that they would need uh, for their local activities. This is what we have done. This is our experience here in Burkina Faso. Uh, I'm happy and open to any questions. Yes, look at the chat, uh, chat box. There might be a question there. Alors, je repars au français. Can you do um, maybe a short presentation of what uh, the Etequini municipality did? No, it's not working. There's load shedding problem in... Oh, yes, it's working. But we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? The sound is not so good, but maybe you can try and do a short intervention and then we'll go to a question. Oh, okay.
I think I think we can't hear you. I'm sorry. I think the connection is too low. Maybe Matsilani can try just without the presentation, just speaking. Yeah, maybe Matsilani without the presentation, it would be easier. Well, anyway, you'll be able to send the presentation so that anyone can read it. Yes. Okay, so. Okay. Um, so I'm really sorry that the sound is really not good. So, uh, uh, yes, I think we can't hear you. So I'm, I'm really sorry. I think I'm gonna take questions and uh, we'll be able to send the presentation. Sorry for this. Uh, so there was a question, Jessica Wallace wanted to ask something. I can give you the floor. Are you still here? Jessica, you wanted to ask something to one of the, to one of the speakers. Okay. Otherwise, uh, maybe just before we end, uh, we can take a few questions uh, in the chat. Uh, <laughs> I don't know which one to choose. Uh, maybe a larger one and uh, the speaker can answer do you think the system is going to change after the the pandemic so who wants to answer this short answer so everyone can give his opinion um i'm happy to have a, a short answer Anna. um yes um i i, I believe it will, it was destined, I think, to always change because of the economic pressures that the smaller growers were starting to, um, to foister onto the traditional market economies, uh, my personal belief. Um, the learnings that we've learned from it um, and the responses to it means that we have to make changes. Um, and, and I would think we all now starting to talk about what we need, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suleiman, you wanted to, would you like to respond? Just to say that it's obvious that things will change. What we have gone through and experienced recently with this pandemic, we have to change uh, our paradigm. There will be a change, obviously because of the pandemic, it has revealed that everyone in one way or another is fairly vulnerable and things can just turn over at any moment. So we have to adapt to uh, today's realities in order to survive. Maybe conclude the session. Or no, Eva will conclude. <laughs> yes, maybe just to add on that question. Um, I think what came out of the survey was that the interesting thing about this this pandemic was that it created links and connection between stakeholders that were not used to work together even if they were working on the same territory and so maybe this is what is actually going to stay afterwards because we can already see that some some supermarkets markets that that had to supply locally to yes yeah buy locally their products uh, because of food shortage, uh, they are already kind of going back to their old uh, system where fruits and vegetables coming from Spain in France are cheaper. 
So this is maybe not something that will stay, but maybe the connections that were built between the stakeholders on one territory is something that is actually a good thing coming out of the crisis and it can stay afterwards. Thank you, Louison. Uh, I don't see any other question within the participants. Uh, maybe, Eva, we can conclude on this, if it's okay with you. It's all, so. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for having participated. And I just wanted to say that it was a really interesting and fruitful discussion that we, we got to listen to today. and. We actually had the largest number of participants uh, today, so thank you all for joining and a special thank you to all of our all of our panelists that shared their expertise and experience with us today. We'll be sending all the reports, summaries and the recording of the session um, early next week to all the participants and you can share that with the with your networks as well. So, and a special thank you to Dominique, the interpreter as well. So. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. And next week, we'll have another session on a different subject. This time, it will be on uh, sustainable energy in Africa. So we'll be sending you uh, that informa information too. Okay, then, well, this session is over. <laughs> thank you, thank very you. Much for the organization. Thank you very okay. much. Bye bye.